can't get it right. Oh, hi guys, it's Jeff. We're at Sage's Sound. Everything's fine. This is what it's like to get in the music business. Uh, it's not all successes, and sometimes you're just trying to get that big hit, and you just can't get it. You just can't get it. Don't turn to drugs, don't turn to alcohol, don't turn to mental problems, turn to this program. You're gonna learn all the things you need to know and become big successes like me and Victor. What can you tell me about Kurt Biscara? Oh my gosh. First of all, he eats balut. That's all you need to know. <laughs> Look it up. Uh, I don't know that he eats it, actually. What can I tell you about Kurt Biscara? Groove, he's a, he's a, he played with the time for crying out loud. He's done all the big tours. Uh, he's got a great attitude. He loves coffee. He is a legend, a studio legend. He was kind of anointed by the great Jeff Picaro. I don't think there's really much more you need to say about him that he can't say himself. I'm here with my friend Kurt Biscara, one of my all-time favorite drummers oh, man. and human beings. You went to school at MI here in Hollywood. I went there specifically to learn how to read. You know, I came up playing in a, in restaurants and nightclubs with my mom, playing, you know, in all my punk rock bands in high school and, you know, different rock bands and stuff like that. My mom and a few of her sisters, they all worked at the Columbia Record Pressing Plant. She would bring home records, man, anywhere from, you know, bebop to experimental, you know, Jimmy Smith, everything across the map, you know, and I'm the youngest of two brothers, so they had their taste of music, which I listened to as well, because it was blurring through their speakers out of their bedroom. So I wanted to go to MI to learn how to read, to be able to play all that mishmash of stuff. I had such a vast record collection, I would read these names on the back of them, and I'd always see, you know, John Robinson, Jeff Picaro, Carlos Vega, Rick Murata, Jerry Murata, and all these names would just go down the list. These guys are always listed as the drummer, and then I read some article on Modern Drummer they were called studio drummers. So I remember seeing, and the ad was Joe Picaro and Ralph Humphrey saying, study with studio drummer legends at Musicians Institute. And I was like, oh my God, that's where I want to go after I graduate high school. Right. Specifically with Ralph playing Odd Meter, which I've never played before. So going there for that alone was worth the tuition. You became friendly with Jeff Picaro, and is that how you came to meet him? Yeah, you know, I mean, studying under Joe, at the school, Jeff would pop in every now and then. And, you know, the story goes when Jeff told me, he goes, yeah, man, I used to keep my eye on you when I'd come in. I'd never let you see me, but I was peeking behind the door, man. I noticed you had a groove, and I was like, I'd tell my dad, Pops, man, you know, keep it, keep an eye on this cat, because he's got the shit. And I didn't know that, but that's what Jeff told me, so, that's okay. Great. It was like getting the complete <laughs> blessing by yeah. the Pope of Groove. And so, as I graduated, I went on tour and did a lot of funk and R&B touring. My first real legit session was in 1990 with Bonnie Raitt, and I played on that single, um, Something to Talk About. And shortly thereafter, I get this call, and it was Jeff Picaro. I answer the phone, hey, Craig B, this is Jeff. I'm like, Jeff who? He's like, Picaro. And I'm like, nah, man, this ain't Jeff Picaro. He's just someone <laughs> fucking with me. Like. But it was him, man. He's like, hey, I'm doing this Boz Kags record, and I want you to be the drummer on it. And it was just like... In that moment, were you nervous to like have to play drums? For... Absolutely, man. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> this is my drum hero, yeah. one of my drum heroes. How am I going to even remotely do what needs to happen? You know, it's like Spider-Man saying, yeah, man, climb that wall. Swing from that building to that building <laughs> and don't fall. The first song he pulls out, it's written out and it's like six pages long. I'm like, oh, fuck. What am I going to do on this, man? And he's like, man, it's easy. And it was like, it wasn't easy. It was like double DSs and codas and shit like that. And I was just like, please just let me get through this chart, please. <laughs> and I did. Barely, but I mean, I talk about it and it's still surreal. Like, yeah. wow, man, my hero hired me to play drums on something he's producing. But one of the nerve wracking things on that session was we were doing overdubs and he's like, hey man, I called up this tune that I found that Keltner played on that I want you to replace. 
<laughs> so here's Jeff McCarl asking me to replace Jim Keltner. And I've told Keltner the story and he just laughs. And I couldn't do it, man. I did like four passes. So Jeff's like, well, let me let me try. And of course he did, does it in one take. Right. And I was just like, okay, that's where I need to get to. That was one of the things that gave me the confidence in the studio was when I witnessed that firsthand. Like, you're Jeff and you're sitting there playing and I was laying on the floor with the headphones on watching them. These guys played with such confidence. Oh, that's what it takes. And whatever happens, fuck it, because I'm going to do what I do, because that's why they called me. If I fuck up, we'll do it again. But I started doing movie dates, and that's all the thing. You got to get it on the first take or else. And that's what's great about music. You know, you don't know what you're going to walk into. And being a studio drummer, that was always the excitement of walking into the studio and not knowing what was on the music stand and not knowing what, what or who the artist was. Yeah. You know. One of the best sessions was doing the duets record with Elton John, and it's with Katie Lang singing the duet. The mic was on in the studio, and... It was the biggest compliment, K Kate, he said. And I could hear over the mic, she went, wow, that drummer's a motherfucker. And then Elton, like, followed up and said, yeah, he is, isn't he? And, and it was, like, the first time working with both of them, and I was just like, oh, my God, you know, is this such a compliment? Other sessions where I would get the, over the talk back, all right, thanks a lot, Kurt, we're done here. And I'm thinking to myself, wait, I only did one take. <laughs> and I, I don't know which records are those, I... On, on purpose forgot which ones but right. those have always those always stuck out of my mind like okay that I sucked and they probably called you to replace me or somebody to replace me that was one of the first things Jeff told me he was like yeah man I get replaced all the time and when I know I'm fucking up I'll just tell him to call Keltner and he'd always say that and I'd ask Jim I was like is that true that Jeff used to say that and he goes oh yeah all the time man he goes I would get these crazy calls from these cats wanting me to play on the record and I was the wrong guy but Jeff would always put me up to the task you know and okay that was for real what would be your advice to young drummers and or old drummers now it's just not about drumming or playing on someone's record or touring it's about a multitude of things because the business has changed so drastically that now we got to wear a bunch of different hats. We got to make videos. We got to engineer. We got to uh, come up with a piece of gear. Diversify. So, this pedal is called the Grease Juicer. Check out the line of pedals at westcopedals.com. These are all hand built custom pedals. And it's got the fuzz too, so that's pretty cool. It's like Bootsy in a box. So, yeah, that's my pedal, the Grease Juicer, West Coast Pedals. Dig it. Yeah. Eva B. Ross, she's an incredible young singer-songwriter, and she came by Tudor Tones and did a trio set with Jonathan and Grant, her two musicians. She's making great records, and we're really lucky to have her on the show. So here she is, take it away, Eva. Like, don't take anything away, just play your music. Push a needle through my skin to fix the threads from where we ripped apart at the seams. Yet all I want to write about is how good it felt when we were making love. Pet names, tangled tipsy, then walking home with fuzzy eyes like film grain. No, how good it felt when we were still in love. Yeah, that's all I want. About, so I'll ignore the end for now. I've got an awful feeling that we won't stay friends. And yet all I want to write about is how good it was with you, is my book ends, and I probably. 
probably should reacquaint myself with what I need and push a needle through my skin to fix the threads where we ripped apart at the seams and all I want to write about is how good it felt when we were making love pet names tangled tipsy then walking home with fuzzy eyes like film grain oh, how good it felt when we were still in love yeah that's all i want to write about so i'll ignore the end for now i'm gonna need it you're gonna need it too i thought i needed it you need me to I've got an awful feeling that this is the end on a little field trip today for Sage and Sound support. Where are we going, Jeff? We are going to custom vintage keyboards in North Hollywood, California. Luke Jones is the guy, mastermind behind uh, custom vintage keyboards, and it's where I store and service all my vintage gear. Luke is a genius of all things vintage keyboards, and so we're gonna go visit him at his Shangri-La, otherwise known as a warehouse. We have the website, um, which, which what has, is the website? It's just cvkeyboards.com. Um, cvkeyboards.com, right there. This is Luke, he is CV Keyboard, captain of the crazy keyboard ship. Yeah, and he he makes all the keyboards. So, so, what happens is Luke posts a really cool keyboard that he's modified. <laughs> And then I ask him if it's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> and then you ask me how much. It is. Yeah, and then we have That's, that talk. Yeah, we have that talk, and then I make it work well and, and look good and do all that stuff, and you turn, you make the magic on it. Uh, it's, uh, I love stuff to look as good as it sounds and to be everything it could be and more. I love those little toy things, just, you know. Look but, at that. Yeah, because I feel like there's so many things that people can just look over. I mean, my favorite part of the job is people coming in with something that, that seems awful, you know, and then completely turning it around into something that you just can't live without. You know, that's the part that I just love because- Does people, anybody ever bring something that looks awful in and you go, oh no, I oh, can't yeah. deal with this. No, I mean, I, I'm a sucker for a project. Otherwise I wouldn't be in this business. And I, I definitely, uh, I'm an optimist when it comes to seeing potential. So I end up, <laughs> I mean, I do all sorts of stuff. I mean, I do, and when I say all sorts of stuff, I mean all sorts of stuff. People ask me for weird, random, all sorts of things, not even just in the keyboard world, but in the everything world. The, well, casing, you know. you're, you're amazing with, the, with, with getting things road ready, which is great. Well, yeah, I mean, I try to be, nah, I used to be a roadie. I've played music. Tell I, me about that. When were you a roadie? Where, uh, for when I was where? a kid, when I in was, uh, yeah, I started actually, working professionally as a roadie when I was 17. Um, I was already buying broken gear and fixing it when I was 13 because I could never afford to buy really cool vintage gear and I've been a vintage addict since I was, you know, looking at those catalog photos and dreaming about having that gear and learning all the tiny things there was to know that are different about this year to that year to all those things. And I was that way for all music gear. I mean, I still am. Right. And it just so happens that between I actually, when I was 14, started doing my cabinet making apprenticeship in Australia and I did furniture making and all that sort of stuff. And um, that lends itself to keyboards because they're all got cabinets, they're all things. So I have a lot of woodworking skills. And um, I worked with Ken Rich for years, who's a you know, master. And I, you know, basically had all the, the things I already understood and knew all the gear that I worked on. And then, you know, together, Ken and I did lots of amazing stuff that, that is, uh, that I love and that is, you know, historic. Yep. And then, you know, we part of ways and we do our stuff two different ways, which I like too. It's kind of like, I always had my way of doing things and he always had his way of doing things. And um, both of them have their own, you know, their own sort of thing. Cause everybody's different. Everybody needs something different. Everybody wants something different. And all I want is to someone to adore their instrument and to not 
say to themselves, oh, well, the plugin sounds pretty good in the mix. I mean, I kind of like that. I'm like, I, and I, I'm not downing plugins and fake that, keyboards. Yeah. There's a place for all that stuff. And I get why people, I mean, I make prop shells for keyboards. I make right. them by the ton, actually. You understand the reality of I that. I totally get the reality of it. It makes total sense why people want to have that. And, you know, I mean, my favorite artists, they, most of them have one or two of their main pieces they tour with and then yeah they'll have another keyboard well there. if you don't have a, a, a tech on the road with you that knows how to replace reeds on a whirly quickly you're screwed right yeah oh, you know there's there's a lot of things people that know about this kind of stuff are very few and far between and uh and especially ones that really truly do know <laughs> are very even further and far between there are people that that uh you know i'm no genius people call me that but yeah i, I just um got a lot of patience i think is the right. ultimate <laughs> and you love it i, th I yeah. feel like when you look at something you actually love for it to be like when i've taken things to you to get fixed you get excited about even going an extra distance to make it even cooler than yeah, like putting I mean, special wood on on the yeah well i mean look your, your maxi cork or something like that maxi corks are awesome they're like they are awesome. I mean, what? There's no one you can't play when you get play Maxi Korg and be like, "Oh, this is no good. It's amazing." So why not? It. But you said to me, you said, "Dude, I have so many synthesizers, and this is like one of my all-time favorites." And I'm like, "Man, coming from Jeff Babco, that's really something." Well, I mean, I, to be honest, there I had 49 D50s in my garage, and that then then that one, so it, it wasn't <laughs> saying much. <laughs> No disrespect yeah. to the fine folks at Roland, but to the classic D50. Yeah. Do you um, ever, now, speaking of which, the classic D50. Now, if somebody brings in a D50 or an M1 or an Insonic something, we, we have I've fixed them all. I mean, it's one of those things. I, I do. I'm always torn between the idea of uh, the value of something. I mean, it's the value of what it's worth to somebody. It's right. the. It's the. You know, it might be the thing that you wrote every hit song that you've ever loved on it, and it might be something that. A lot of people scoff at it might be a dx7 or whatever it is but you know like every instrument is a unique one even one world to another world or even totally. one clavinet to another clavinet they're all unique which is why people will say like oh man my whatever it is is the greatest well right. yours it might be well my as, as you uh, know my my weird 1981 roads yeah, is yeah. One, that's the first one i had so yeah. i i yeah. get it's it's, it's got it's a side quickly, to and they have a sound, you know? Totally. And when people bring, like you were saying, do you ever say, oh God, I'm not gonna look at something. I just, some people. Do. I always like, I, I pretty much work on anything, but at the end of the day, I'll, I'll say to someone, okay, what do you wanna get out of it? How, how like, you know, what does this mean to you? What are you gonna use it for? What sort of music are you into? You know, because there are times I do say to people, you know what, you should sell this one. I said it's worth whatever the street you value is, to me too, yeah. and I'm like, let's find you the one that's going to make you, you know, that you're going to love. Because I can make this one good, but I probably can't make it great. You know, an right. awesome keyboard that's inspiring is. I've had you know people always say, oh, all the names you work for, all the. I'm like, that isn't. <laughs> I, that's not what it is for me at all. But having someone appreciate what that, how amazing the keyboard is, how much it inspires them. People, I mean, I've had people that, you know, you wouldn't know their name, but I know that they truly appreciate the instrument. They'll call me back again and again. Dude, I just, I can't tell you, this thing is just mind boggling. I can't stop playing it. Right. That's what I'd rather hear. It doesn't matter if it comes from, you know, whoever it is. I just want them, you know, I mean, someone, I want someone to care about their instrument the same way I care about it. Right. And that's the inspiration, you know, that's what makes me want to keep doing it. Right. I just want someone to hold. Yeah. And sometimes the uh, <laughs> keyboard to hold, you know? Yeah, that's true. I, I've had some epic challenges that I I often think to myself at the start, man, how am I going to work this out? Be it modifying controller keyboards to make them this big or make them look like combo organs or do so many different things or or restore something that's, that is so far gone that I'm not sure it's going to make it. And being like, man, those parts don't exist and having to like hand machine parts yeah, out, I've seen you spend guys endless that, yeah. hours and just, you know, but that's the thing. I, I, I love the idea so much of things that, taking something that no one else can really bring back to life. That's kind of, it's the thing. I mean, you know, I've had people, you know, Ali from Tribe Called Quest called me like a few days before the Grammys and goes, dude, we're playing on the Grammys. You know, this is last year with you before whatever it is. And I want a custom bass to match the Tribe stuff. And I just made him these custom turntable stands that lit up 
and they folded up as well so you could gig with them because you want to be able to gig with sure. them right you want to be able to move stuff so you right. got to make it movable and uh and he loved that and he goes dude i need a bass done like that and i want it like in three days or four days or whatever it was i'm like ah oh. Uh, <laughs> you said okay, probably. Like, why I, did we say okay to gigs? I, I did. We were sure. I did. I I stayed up like two nights, got it done. You know, a bass piece, a bass, a P bass. You know, like a classic. Did, did he black give you the bass? bass? He gave me the bass, and then I modified it all with the Tribe Called Quest uh, sort of you know style they use on all their stuff. And uh, and he used it. He called me as he was walking off stage. I could hear the crowd in the background. He goes, "Dude, you just you're the best." And that to me is totally yeah. I, I don't I don't care about any of the other stuff because, and it's not even that it's Ali though. Ali is a gentleman um, and a legend, but it's what's one of those things. Those those people that love what they do appreciate it. I do it all for them. Yeah, we love you. Thanks, brother. What a guy! Look at this guy. So that's Luke. not true listen we're glad you could join us for another episode of, of sage and sound advice and we are so fortunate to have met the Mooney family Jim Mooney of course started the studio that gave this show its name sage and sound we talked to the family about studio life life of an engineer life of an engineer's family we hope you enjoyed it so I'm really sorry I gotta get back to practicing two three four <laughs> it's hard to be a musician's wife. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. <laughs> but it looked like looking at the calendar that you that you have that that once the studio was up and running and the word of mouth got out, oh, it didn't was... look like there was a lot of. It looked like he was working almost every day. Yes, he was at long hours. But he loved it. He really did, you know. Well, at those days, it was analog entirely. Yeah. Guess when we retired in 98, it, digital was coming in, mm -hmm. yeah. and people were starting to record their own stuff. Yeah. So we left at a good time. Yes, mm -hmm. you did. You did. And besides, I think his ears were going, because, as you know, producers have a tendency to want their music. Whatever they're paying for, they want to hear it. Yeah. And they don't care about your ears. Loud in the studio, on the big stage. Yeah. Yeah. And all the silly in the ears go. No. They were completely gone when he retired. No. But he still did some engineering from here. We drove up to L.A. And how and often people. would you go to visit a recording session? Uh, well, for a while I worked in the office, but then I had to get a real job so that we could get some medical. Yeah, that works, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so I had, had worked for Department of Water and Power for 16 years, and so I went back to city. You showed me a beautiful inscription from Art Pepper. Were there people that came to record at the studio that stuck out to you that you guys became friendly with? Art Pepper, you remember Sunny Stip? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, in fact, they did a recording together. Sunny Stip would sleep on the couch, Art Pepper on the chair in the in the office. <laughs> Uh, Ron Ashtay, he mm -hmm. was one of my favorites. He used to call me mom. Is there any recollection of when Chet Baker was there? I remember, uh, I think it was at the recording before he went to Paris and lost his life. Yeah. Um, he played very well, which was very nice because we had not too much before that listened to him at Shelley's manhole, and he was horrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does happen to them. Mm -hmm. that, sadly. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, he was very good, and, and Jim told him the reason he loved jazz so much is he, he enjoyed listening to Chet Baker so much. 
and he got to hear all the jazz musicians that he enjoyed playing with throughout his life. When we were young, he'd hold the babies and listen to music. Huh, oh, you don't remember, do you? <laughs> Horace Silver, yeah. Oh, yeah, Horace Silver. And he even came out here for our jazz festival because we used to go to his house um, for his birthdays. But anyway, we've had some really good friends. It's just that my mind is not what it used to be. And we were 30 years in that studio, and it's 20 years later, and... Yeah. <laughs> Nothing stopped him. <laughs> amazing guy I, to this day. I, I, I'm in amazement of him. That's so great. Yeah. I wish I could have been. Okay, you big chicken. You're looking for more food. Yeah. Good yeah. man. That's, that way. That's great. That's all you can. That's that's what you'd want as your. Uh, that's what you had. You want to be remembered. I think. Right? Yeah. For sure. Again, time has passed. It's another episode of Sage and Sound Advice. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we had fun presenting it to you. Sorry. Have a great day and keep supporting. Patreon, me and Vic, we depend on this. Our livelihood depends on this. We're so busy with sessions and investing the money that we make there that we kind of need more just to make this show happen. So your dollars at work. Uh, here's the website, and uh, tell your friends, and don't let another time pass without tuning into an episode. Thanks so much. Sayonara, as we say in Japan. Adios, and all the best. From me and Vic. Ciao. He's a he's a very special uh, some weirdo guy sticks. Wow, Ed Shaughnessy, he was great. He was amazing. Wow, can you believe this is the second episode in the can? What does that mean in the can? I have no idea. That was really fun though, wasn't it? This was the most fun uh, getting to talk to Kurt Vizcarra. Like, who knew all of these amazing stories that he had involving the late great Jeff Picaro? And, and yet another instance of a guy having siblings and he got all his record and, and another realization that I'm an only child and I had no hope to learn music. So the lesson here is really if you're an only child to try and talk your parents into having more children, is that it? Or give up. Or give up, yes. No, but, but it was interesting. He has such an interesting perspective. Yeah, and having been able to be a young drummer in the presence of the Picaro family. But the greats. And really. have, yeah, that's... Cool. And then what about getting to meet Eva and Grant and Jonathan really gave me hope in the young peoples. It's true. Uh, they are such positive people. They are really good, creative, but, but also like fully formed musicians. It's kind of, we were all that age once. Forget that we had a perspective, but I love it too. Um, they're really great, positive, talented people. Gives us hope. Um, and then getting to go talk with Luke, uh, that was the first time I got to meet Luke. I was so blown away by this guy's passion for what he does. And I think I even told him that the world would be a better place if everybody cared about what they do as much as he does. It's true. He, he's, uh, I learned, you know, I've, I've known Luke a long time and I learned a lot about him that day. And, but what I always knew about him is how passionate he is about his craft. And we even meet musicians, like session musicians, or that don't have that passion anymore. And to, to see a guy that's building a cabinet and customizing instruments and just just as passionate, if not more, than, than most musicians we know, yeah. he's creating too. Yeah. It's cool. And then also to, you know, again, get to uh, speak with the Mooney family is really, was very, very special. And uh, really a big thanks to them for allowing us to be in their home and, and share their memories of Jim. Yeah, how, how cool to, to get for, for them, I, I think, to, to look back at a significant chapter, kind of the thread in their lives that, you know, uh, t 
to look back, I don't know how often they get a chance to publicly reflect, and, and it was really fun for us to get to learn uh, the daily life of a studio in the 70s and 80s. It's different than it is now, but what a legacy. Yeah, and amazing, and hopefully, my hope is for all the viewers, is that you look up all of these people, that all these names and pictures whiz by, these interviews, but if you look up these people, there's so much there. There's not really, like when we were growing up, we had album covers, and so we could see all of these names, and these names were these amazing ghostly figures that we looked up to, right? And, and we would seek out and try to find out about them. Now it's a little bit harder that this program does that for people. Totally. I, what I, and, and Victor's saying that reminds me that, you know, I, I, uh, if you follow my dumb Instagram or anything, you probably know that I'm hunting for records often. And what I realized is that because there are so many vinyl stores now, it's a great chance for you to do what we did when we were young and look, I, I buy albums just based on the liner notes. If I see that Jim Gordon and Mike Lang and, and Joe Osborne are on a record, I might pick it up even that, and it might be terrible, but you know what? I, I would say I was listening to a record last night and there will be one track you just go, yeah. even one pre-chorus, you go, yep, that was worth it. Like, uh, you, you totally have the capability of, of digging through crates and discovering things like we did, and you might find a record that Jim Mooney recorded um, and, and get to discover, kind of window into that world in that time. Yeah. Pretty cool. And uh, hopefully hang, hang with us. We have a lot, a lot more coming up that's really, really exciting. We're working on so many interviews and behind-the-scenes stuff that is, I think is just getting better and better. There's a uh, rumor that Isaac Hayes might do. <laughs> no, he's, he's passed. Might be a different Isaac. Uh, but, but regardless, it's going to be a really good program. The next one, uh, it might even be better than this one. Yeah. Who's to say? Can't, I'm not quite not. It, it might not be better than this one. Yeah. This might be as good as it gets and then just say, you know, <laughs> no, nah, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to do something else. But Victor and Drizzo, I'm Jeff Babco. This is Sage and Sound Advice. Uh, stay tuned for episode three. Not right now. Not you now. can do things. Uh, have a Salisbury steak, hungry man dinner. Mm, you could do that. I suggest it. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I look handsome in that kid. Yeah, it's so handsome. <laughs>